Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. When I was growing up back in the 1950s and 60s, manufacturing was a cornerstone of the American economy. We made everything from cars and trucks to televisions, toasters, and toys for children. It was a fabulous source of employment, and the pay and benefits were good, often very good. And then much, if not most, of that golden sector of the economy seemed to vanish, and the jobs with it lost to globalization and miraculous technological advancements. My guest says it's too early to give up on manufacturing, that a revival of the sector in the U.S. is not just important, but essential. He's Lou Uchitel, a former colleague of mine at the New York Times and the author of the new book, Making It, Why Manufacturing Still Matters. Lou, welcome. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. Uh, all right, I'll bite. Why does manufacturing still matter. Uh, naysayers will tell you that the U.S. is better off uh, focusing on other aspects of, uh, of the economy, uh, looking for economic growth, uh, uh, innovation, uh, more creative enterprises. Why manufacturing? Well, let me start by saying we're still a huge manufacturing nation. What's changed is that when manufacturing what's w once was when you me measure it in terms of value added or income, once was national income, it once was nearly 30% of uh, the national income, the gross right. domestic product. It's now slipped to um, about 12%, it got mm -hmm. down as low as 10, it's now about 12%. That's not because we stopped making stuff, we still make more stuff each year, but other sectors of the economy grew faster. And, and they, that still happens. So that's one aspect. We're a huge manufacturing nation, but its share of the national uh, economy has shrunk. So that's, that's one problem. The second problem is uh, the rise of multinationals. Two thirds of the manufacturing that does go on in this country is done by multinational corporations. And they don't, they're not interested in exporting. They, uh, put their factories in other countries to serve those other countries. I saw that happening while I was covering economics for the New York Times. It really got started in the 80s. And the third thing is uh, really, and I think it's the most important thing, over the years I began to accumulate stories and it, as I started writing this book, it dawned on me that I couldn't find a manufacturer in this country that wasn't publicly subsidized. Now, when I pu say publicly subsidized, I mean public money in one form or another. Examples? Uh, well, the Defense Department buys weapons made uh, that are made uh, under Buy America clauses that are made in this country. That by itself is 12% of uh, GDP. So when uh, Trump goes over to uh, Israel and makes a, uh, an arms deal, one of the things he's doing is supporting the manufacturing sector. He comes back and orders are placed with domestic manufacturers and the domestic content is very high and that's exported. So, but what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that this is a good thing or not such a great thing? I, it's not such a great thing. It's good and it's bad. It's <laughs> so it, fi it, it sort of fights what we're talking about if we want to expand uh, the percentage of uh, the national economy that comes from manufacturing. On the other hand, we want to cut back on some of those aspects of manufacturing that we're subsidizing now. Uh, where do we end up? Well, we end up with less manufacturing. So we have to sit there and say, I mean, uh, Eisenhower was right. Beware the in industrial, military industrial, in, complex. military industrial complex. Military spending on manufactured goods is uh, comes to maybe 12 or 13 or 14 percent of 
the national income. On top of that, if you go out and take a look at the police cars in New York City or the garbage disposal trucks that I see on the streets, they're all made in America. There's a lot of, in all the public spend, the government spending on all levels in this country, there's a tendency to, as much as possible, do buy America. So we're in a situation where manufacturing is subsidized, but a huge sector, a segment of that subsidy is in the form of public money not really the word subsidy hardly covers it. I use that word, right. is in the form of public money for weaponry and for police cars and for sanitation trucks and so forth. So we- Well, a lot, a lot of that vast majority of Americans would be in favor of. There's a big difference yeah. between selling weapons to countries uh, or entities overseas and building police cars or garbage trucks or- Well, we missed something here. We tried to convert from military production to domestic production. We did it after World War II and we were very successful because of the huge built up, pent up demand for uh, uh, domestic goods. And other economies have been devastated by devastated, the war, so, so there was, we there was were no pretty much standing alone. But then after the Korean War, in, uh, where, when we geared up again for military, we, and I use General Dynamics as an example, uh, we went back to making domestic goods, and it turned out that that was neither as profitable as making weapons, nor uh, was there the demand there. So weapons makers often went back to making weapons. Now, where we should have stepped in here we should have said to ourselves, there's a lot of public money in manufacturing. Maybe a third of all, if there's two, about two trillion a year in manufacturing output, a third of that is public money. We probably should have said then, even though General Dynamics or any other GE or anyone else might not be as profitable as necessary, we should insist uh, in exchange for the mo public money on a bigger share of civilian goods. Some other countries have done um, better in terms of uh, the percentage of the economy that is um, covered by manufacturing. Germany uh, comes yeah. immediately to mind, but there are others as well. What have they done that's been different from what the U.S. has done? Well, they, they recognize that manufacturing is a public activity or a subsidized activity. We don't recognize it as much as we should. I hope my book helps to make that point. The other thing they do is they recognize that since it's a national activity, there should be some public representation. So m many of the manufacturing companies that are German owned have on the corporate boards representatives of labor. And it's pretty hard for a German company to say, I'm gonna put a, we're gonna put a, a factory in Arizona the board member who's representing the unions, the labor segment of Germany, gets up and says, no, you're not. Or he fights it or he argues with it. He challenges. We don't have that challenge. Well, um, it, it's one thing to have uh, labor represented on the boards of uh, corporations, for example. And also, I think uh, labor should be better protected. Um, the labor movement yeah. should be better protected by, by the government. Um, but that's one thing. But one of the more controversial aspects, I think, of, of your book is uh, you talk about uh, the need for an industrial policy in the United States that would actually uh, result in uh, curtailing uh, free trade or what's considered free trade in this country, and that would designate winners and losers in the various um, sectors. Talk about that a, l a little bit. Why, why do we need it and how might it work? I hate that phrase, winners and losers. When I was first, uh, when this issue first came up, when I was in the, writing on the economy for the Times, uh, the prevailing economic theory was that uh, no one should, economics should be left to the markets and no one should designate winners and losers. Really free trade. Really free trade. And in fact, we should be designating winners and losers. <laughs> and we don't have. Uh, free trade. In, no, we don't have free trade. We should uh, say, look, uh, we should designate, uh, let's take an example. General Motors makes in China, with a Chinese partner and subsidies from China, about two million cars a year. What we should be saying is General Motors, 
we're going to make you, uh, we're going to designate you a winner if you want to use that terminology. General Motors, you have to make one million of those two million cars here in America and export them. And never mind free trade. <laughs> uh, we're subsidizing you. We bailed you out. We've saved you from bankruptcy. You put that, you, you expand your factory plus the workers. And the Chinese, of course, would go up a wall, I suppose. Uh, but that's the function of government. Uh, to uh, uh, to work that out uh, in one of these economic summits that we have with China and God only knows how many other countries, those are the issues should, that should be thrashed out almost every day and should be in the newspapers almost every day, and they aren't. Well, one of the things that concerns me, whether we're talking about manufacturing or even other aspects of the economy, is is employment. And what has happened, we've seen astounding technological yes. advances, and there have been amazing advances in the factories, on the, on the factory yeah, absolutely. floors. So you don't need as, as many workers um, as, you once, as you once did. My question is, even if we expanded the portion of the economy devoted to manufacturing in the U.S., how much of an effect would that have on employment? How much could we expect that to increase employment in this country? Relatively little. Uh, manufacturing employment post-World -war, War II uh, reached a peak of about 19 million, a little over in 1979. And then it went downhill rather rapidly to about 10 million, and it's now about 12 million. Let's say we increase manufacturing output to a to 12 or 18, to 18 or 19 percent of the national income. Maybe that would add a million, maybe two million jobs. Not a lot. We're not going to get a lot of factory jobs, but we do have a problem that has to be solved. We have a trade deficit. Every time the Chinese send us something, we pay them in dollars. The Chinese should be able to, under normal trade theory, come back and spend those dollars on goods in the United States. They can't. So what do they do? Where they still you mean they're not permitted. No, they certainly are permitted, but we don't have the goods. We're not making. They're making many more manufactured goods than we are. We don't have what oh, to you sell mean them because of the uh, the uh, absence of of, of enough, ma enough manufacturing. We don't have more manufacturing. Right. We used to be able to sell food all over the world, but we can't even do that anymore. So what do the Chinese do with the dollars? They want to keep selling us goods. They take the dollars that we pay them for their goods and they invest them in treasury bills and in U.S. government securities. That's, we're still, after all, the, the, the world currency, the dollar. That money is invested in, in treasuries. The government, in effect, releases the money to the public. More goods are bought from China, and the process goes on and on. One day, the Chinese are going to say, and I'm using the Chinese, the Asians, others are going to say, we don't trust the dollar anymore. We, or we don't want to do this. Uh, we're just going to uh, spend the money here in our own infrastructure and all sorts of things. And we're going to... In which case we would be in a fix. We would be in a fix. We would suddenly have to spend... We would suddenly have to start finding some way to make stuff ourselves. Well, how would you imagine the U.S. going about um, expanding sharply, significantly expanding the manufacturing sector uh, in this country. And, and, and what kinds of items do you imagine we'd be making? Well, let me start. First, we have to recognize that manufacturing is a subsidized market activity. The present subsidy system is chaotic. Uh, for example, if St. Louis wants uh, uh, Ford to put a factory in St. Louis rather than Kansas City, uh, the two cities bid against each other, and the winner, winning bidder. So you might, get tax breaks. You, you get, get all lands, sorts of. All, all that breaks. should be put into a national industrial policy that brings, uh, that sets a goal. It says uh, we have to have uh, manufacturing has to be twelve. Uh, instead of being twelve percent of the national income, we have to go back up towards seventeen, eighteen, nineteen percent, which is where everyone else but is. Could you could you imagine? either a major party favoring that? And could you imagine the business community in America writ large supporting it? I think the business community would go along with that. I think the major, I think we got Trump, who is a... Well, apart from, apart no, but from he's, Trump. He's, he, he is sort of a, 
a nightmare reflection of this problem, if I may say so, eventually we're going to get someone or some set of government officials, and I, there's many who understand it, who begin to sort this out. And uh, they're going to have to come to the public and say, look, if we don't get more, you'll be all right, and your children will be all right, but your grandchildren will suddenly will find themselves living in a world in which the dollar isn't so desirable to hold. The, um, and then they'll be in trouble. Let's talk about productivity a little bit. Um, All right. We mentioned the um, amazing technological advances that have occurred, and, and that yeah. meant incredible productivity advances. It used to be, and one of the reasons why manufacturing uh, contributed so much to rising right. living standards was that workers um, participated in the benefits from increased productivity. Right. So if factories were, if there was more of an output from the factory, some of that money would go to profits, some of it would be in, invested in, in, the, in the companies, and some of it would go to wages and benefits uh, for, for workers, so short-term wages, sometimes long-term benefits. Um, and then that started to turn around sharply and workers get very little and have, and for many years now, have received very little in terms of the benefits from increased productivity. Why did that happen? And how were manufacturers, employers, able to get away with that? Well, they, let me start with manufacturing is a very unique activity. Very few, I don't think there's any other industry that generates as much value added as manufacturing does. When you take a sheet of steel that's worth $100 and stamp it into a fender, that fender is then worth $125. That is, it can, you've got a $25 gain. That, that has to be split between labor and profits and the cost of the factory and the machinery and so forth. But manufacturing workers, because they work together and are so closely organized, uh, uh, had the ability to leverage a fairly good share of that $25. And there's, you don't get $25 in value added when you go into uh, uh, McDonald's right. and ask a, for a hamburger. The, the ingredients might be $5 and the, and the guy cooking it gets, a, the cooking process is 50 cents. The value added is very little. There's not much to split. In manufacturing, there's a lot to split. And, uh, and if government's involved in the subsidies anyway, uh, manufacturing is a unique opportunity to spread income uh, to ordinary workers. And, we've, and, and, they've, and when they were well organized in unions and not uh, weak uh, as they are now, that happened. Well, union membership has declined. Certainly in manufacturing, it's declined. Uh, we move factories. Even in this country, we have this policy of taking a publicly subsidized activity and allowing uh, General Motors or General Electric or any of these people to go south to some town that wasn't unionized. <laughs> we never should have allowed that to happen. We should recognize that labor has a, has a stake in this. If it's publicly subsidized, that means that all the uh, stakeholders should have a, sh a share of this. We, they don't just go to the south or out west or to some other place and, you know, they, they go yeah. overseas. As, you know, it's, it's offshore. So um, that's the leads biggest, to my question. We went south once, now we go <laughs> right. overseas. We thought it was bad when they went south, <laughs> now it's worse um, because of the free trade agreements. So we have these free trade agreements, go all the way back to um, NAFTA back in the, back in the 90s. Uh, yeah. It was supposed to be almost a panacea. That's the way it was sold by the politicians. It was going to help... Uh, uh, NAFTA, for example, was going to help Mexico, was going to help Canada, but it was also going to help the United States, including the workers uh, in the United States. Well, um, overall, there have been subsequent free trade agreements to NAFTA. How, have, um, how has the U.S. Uh, benefit, how much has the U.S. benefited from these free trade agreements, and what's been the impact on workers in the United States? Well, I think... I don't think the workers have benefited at all, and I think what's happened is you have a free, I'll give you an example, you have a free trade agreement with Mexico, it was one of the first, 
uh, if I may say so, the Clintons were right. instrumental in this. Uh, I remember writing columns in opposition to that at right. the time. I was told I didn't understand trade. Well, you didn't, <laughs> <laughs> as it's practiced in this country. Right. So if you go south of the border, of the you know Texas-Arizona border there, in a morning's drive, you can run across a string of uh, factories that are like you know, turrets and imagine a line. All the major auto companies assemble autos south of the border. Uh, and I don't mean just the American right. owned companies, but uh, Honda and all the others. They then uh, ship those, and, and they can do it under free trade agreements. They can ship those cars north to the United States as easily as, uh, as cars are shipped or, uh, between Arizona and Texas or Ohio and Indiana. Or whatever, however you want to uh, do it in this country. So that made it very pleasant. You could put a factory just south of the border. The labor was cheaper. Better yet, the uh, Mexicans had even more free trade agreements than we do. Mm -hmm. They did, right now they have about 50, <laughs> uh, and we only have about 22. Right. So they could take making a, a, a Honda, Honda or whatever in Mexico. You could ship it to uh, Veracruz or where have you, and ship, and from there overseas to other countries uh, that had free trade agreements with Mexico. That goes on to this day. Those factories should not be overseas, they should be back here. Now, if they, let's say all eight of those factories come back, well, maybe I'll add 100,000 uh, 100, or 200,000 people to the workforce. Not a lot, but some. It will uh, dramatically improve the uh, free, the, uh, you know, our balance, balance of trade, right. which is very important in the long run. And it will give, uh, it, it will spread across this country the investment, the suppliers who are very important, the infrastructure that's necessary to ship cars around, it's a, it's a better way to, do, to go. Labor was so important, not just because they um, looked out and negotiated, uh, imp looked out for and negotiated improved uh, uh, pay and benefits for workers, but it was a major political force in this country, so it helped shape policy, national policy and policy uh, policies of state and local governments. Sure. Um, so we know that the uh, labor unions are in trouble. My question is, is it at all possible for workers to begin to get truly a fairer shake without a revival of some form of organizing among workers, whether the traditional labor uh, unions or some other form of organization? I think there must be organized labor. It, uh, every company should have a lay, uh, should organized, should be organized. It happened to be easy to organize factories because everybody was right. working next to each other and they got together and they organized and they formed unions. And the union movement in this country was, uh, was built around factories. As those factories have gone overseas or as production has escaped this country, the labor unions have also declined. I think you should think in terms of more manufacturing in this country as also a means of strengthening labor unions and the labor movement. I think without the labor movement, uh, we will not be able to solve the trade deficit, for example, and uh, we will eventually, uh, without manufacturing, the, uh, the opportunity the, uh, uh, to organize labor uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll, we'll, we're losing it now and right. it's getting worse. So the two go together. And that's one of the tragedies of this. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. The book is called Making It, Why Manufacturing Still Matters. The author is Lou Uchitel. Lou, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. The United States, which is supposed to be a nation of laws, is becoming a nation of bullies. We saw it in the boorish behavior throughout the Trump campaign for president. We saw it on the eve of a special election in Montana when Greg Gianforte won a seat in the House of Representatives, despite being accused of body slamming a reporter for asking a question Gianforte did not like. Bullying online has become so pervasive that most of us take it for granted. 
and it has reached epidemic levels in our schools, often with devastating consequences. We are not paying close enough attention to this poisonous phenomenon, which is upending long-standing norms and threatening the very nature of our civil society. There is not a great deal of distance between the widespread bullying that we're seeing, with its lack of empathy, its demonizing of the other, its delight in suffering, and the brutal hate crimes that are occurring in the United States with such horrifying frequency. Two men were murdered and a third was nearly killed on a train in Portland, Oregon, as they tried to aid two teenage girls who had been accosted, bullied, by a man screaming anti-Muslim slurs. The attacker, enraged at being confronted, pulled a knife and stabbed all three of the men who had tried to intervene. That attack occurred on May 26th. On March 4th, a Sikh man was shot and seriously wounded outside his home in Kent, Washington, by a man who shouted, go back to your own country. These kinds of attacks do not occur in a vacuum. We have created an environment in America that not only tolerates, but often applauds hateful and dehumanizing rhetoric that encourages violent confrontations and that has grown far too comfortable with expressions of brutal contempt for those with whom we disagree politically or philosophically. We need to stop and take the time to look in a mirror and ask, what are we allowing ourselves as a nation to become? That's all for now. See you next time.